is I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker tonight, who has, as of was Monday, a new new positions to uh, to put to his name. Stephen Wertheim is the a senior fellow in the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he tells me he's, you know, currently still working at home, but he'll be working with a, a small team. Um, in his position, it sounds just a wonderful opportunity. And he is also, for this coming year, a visiting research scholar at the Center for Global Legal Challenges at Yale Law School. I think you hear a theme here, Statecraft, Global Legal Challenges, and his current book, which he's going to speak tonight about tonight, speaking about um, the United States and our own global statecraft uh, and um, how we came to dominate the skies and um, um, with uh, during World War II. So Stephen, it is a pleasure to have you here at the Athenaeum tonight, and I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Well, thank you so much, Beth. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and for inviting me, and thanks to everyone for joining virtually in what I hope is the tail end of whatever it is we've been living through, though perhaps some of the virtual uh, access will endure. So my book tries to answer a question that you might think is straightforward and has been answered many times before. The question is why the United States came to make itself the preeminent political and military power in the world. When did it first decide to pursue global supremacy as an objective? Today, it's almost taken for granted in the town behind me, which is Washington, DC, that the United States must be number one in military power and lead a system of military alliances with US forces stationed around the world. When experts and officials discuss foreign policy today, they tend to assume US armed dominance to be a kind of self-evident good. It, it's the premise from which they'll then debate what specific strategy or policy to adopt. But this was not always the case. Armed primacy wasn't a goal articulated by George Washington or John Quincy Adams or Abraham Lincoln. That, that much is pretty clear. So at, at some point between then and now, American officials and intellectuals must have decided to embrace military dominance and make it a kind of axiomatic truth in American politics. And I'll, I'll sometimes ask audiences, when they think that moment of decision came, I won't do that here in our virtual environment, but trust me, they give a remarkably wide range of dates. Sometimes it's uh, 1898 or even after the Civil War, sometimes World War II, any part of the 1940s is put forward, even the 1990s. So a whole century of range is rather wide. It suggests a kind of lack of, of a public understanding or agreement. So what I'll argue today is that a clear decision for dominance was made, and it occurred before the Cold War, and even before the attack on Pearl Harbor put the United States into the Second World War. It happened in 1940 and 41 in the span of just 18 months. That is, before America officially entered World War II, many were already planning to lead the post-war world. Now, first, you may be wondering why there's anything new to say here. Surely, scholars have asked and answered how the United States made this decision for dominance before. But I would submit that historians and political scientists and others have developed two distinct ways of avoiding or deflecting this question. So one group of scholars interprets the history as the victory of internationalism in an age old struggle against isolationism. The idea is that these two camps competed uh, throughout American history or certainly in the first half of the 20th century before one of them internationalism finally triumphed. The problem is that this story writes history backwards. It's as if certain people, the internationalists, favored American military dominance all along. They just needed to sweep the other folks, the isolationists, out of the way. 
But in fact, few self-described internationalists prior to World War II wanted the United States to be politically and militarily preeminent. What made them internationalists was their desire to avoid or transcend power politics. That's what American leaders said they wanted for most of American history. They hoped peaceful interaction could supplant the reign of force, the circulation of goods, ideas, and people would give expression to the harmony among nations and prevent the resort to war. From this traditionally internationalist perspective, armed supremacy by the United States or any other power looked unnecessary at best and imperialistic at worst. Now there's a second camp of scholars. These scholars dismiss isolationism as a myth and argue that America was always a superpower in the making. After all, didn't, America, didn't the United States expand constantly, whether driven by the material dynamics of capitalism or the ideology of exceptionalism? And it's true that the United States has expanded its power uh, quite consistently since it began as 13 colonies. But if anything, this interpretation of history gets us farther away from the question of how the people who make and shape American foreign policy acquired consciously the will to lead the world politically and militarily. It assumes that what they said that they wanted didn't much matter. This view ignores how reluctant American policymakers were to undertake what they construed as entanglements in Europe and Asia. The United States possessed the largest economy of any nation by 1870. And it overtook the size of the economy of the entire British Empire in World War I. But decade after decade, America's economic supremacy didn't seem to imply a need for military supremacy. Only a rupture would change this state of affairs. Now that rupture did not come in World War I. President Woodrow Wilson, of course, proposed that America join a new League of Nations at the end of the war. But he pitched this league as a disentangling alliance, which was supposed to eliminate and replace the balance of power. His goal was to transcend power politics in the name of public opinion. It was public opinion, he said, that would prevent a need for routine armed policing by any supreme power. As a result, all through the 1920s and 30s, uh, even supporters of the League of Nations, which the United States did not join, were ambivalent as to whether they wanted armed sanctions to actually be used as part of League membership. It wasn't until the crises of the 1930s that the League itself became known as a collective security organization, at which point supporters of it in America ran from it because the whole point for them was that they did not want to go to war. They didn't want to join a vehicle to wage war. Now, in the 1930s, self-described internationalists in America watched fascist and communist powers rise in Europe and Asia. They understood them as totalitarian powers, which seemed irreconcilable with a system of international law, trade, and norms. And so they began to doubt the belief that had united American internationalists, that a kind of basic harmony of interest lay latent in the world that could be unleashed and bring about peace. They pioneered a whole host of new concepts to convey a sense that in this new kind of a world, armed enforcement really would be required to preserve world order. In fact, world order was one of those new categories which began to replace uh, the category of world peace. Another was isolationism. Isolationism was an epithet uh, since alleged isolationists, almost to a person, insisted they were no such thing. But it was really important that this term isolationism came into being for the first time in widespread usage in the 1930s. It revealed something about the people who used it. Starting in the 1930s, they branded as isolationists all those opposed to the armed enforcement of world order and yet isolationism connoted something further, a desire to keep us out of everything in the phrase of FDR's speechwriter playwright, Robert Sherwood. 
So for opposing the use of force, for not wanting to go to war outside of the Western hemisphere, isolationists stood accused of wanting to cut off interaction completely with the outside world. This new conceptualization of isolationism destroyed peaceful intercourse as a viable option. It implied that interaction without force was really impossible, that free intercourse actually required force to back it. So assumptions about the nature of international order were changing in the 1930s, but those changes didn't yet mean all that much for American foreign policy. Why, after all, should the United States be the one to supply force behind international law and order when Britain and France seemed perfectly capable of doing it themselves? That was President Roosevelt's position when Britain's soon-to-be ambassador, Lord Lothian, visited him early in 1939. Lothian arrived to the White House and told FDR that Anglo-Saxon civilization, to quote Lothian, needed a new guardian. The United States had to take the torch of world leadership from Great Britain. FDR was not having it. He mocked Lothian, got mad, and told him, that what the British need today is a good stiff grog. So the president of the United States preferred that Britain take the lead, let them bear the burden. And that remained the position of American foreign policy elites when the war broke out. Fascists may have promised to set up a new order, but the Anglo-French alliance stood in the way and seemed superior to the challengers. In the United States, policymakers perceived little interest in joining the war, much less in seeking supremacy after the war, so long as Europe and Asia remained, as usual, divided and Britain supreme. Consider the post-war planners who got to work inside and especially outside the government. Inside the government, in the State Department, at the end of 1939, a small 11 person group was convened but the real action came in the Council on Foreign Relations, which was then 20 years old, but already an important think tank. Just two weeks after the war in Europe began, leaders of the council went to the State Department and they said, look, we know that you diplomats are short staffed. You don't have the resources to undertake long range planning. Let us do it for you. We will send you our studies. We'll follow your directives and we don't need any money. We've got the Rockefeller Foundation to fund us. And State Department said, that sounds like a good deal. And so the council gathered a group of about 100 experts to do post-war planning. Uh, here was the US foreign policy establishment at the time, uh, writ small. It included the Army's top planner, General George V. Strong, the future CIA director, Alan Dulles. Uh, it included America's leading Keynesian economist, Alvin Hansen of Harvard, and his neoclassical rival, Jacob Viner of Chicago. These planners were transplanted, many of them into the State Department after Pearl Harbor, but until then they were the main people doing post-war thinking and planning for the United States. But I don't wanna get ahead because I wanna take seriously the period of the so-called phony war from September, 1939 to May of 1940. At that time, America's planners didn't know what they wanted. They didn't want Nazi Germany to win, but they also feared that Britain and France might win quickly and set up an exclusive trading bloc that might exclude the United States. Mostly they expected another stalemate like the last war. And so they spent most of their time in the State Department planning to bring Mussolini's Italy to the side of the democracies in an attempt to mediate a settlement in Europe. The one thing almost all of them could agree on that it would be taboo, in the words of the council planners, for the United States to make political and military commitments beyond the Western Hemisphere after the war. That was essentially unimaginable. The military group of the council was led by future CIA director, Alan Dulles. And I wanna tell you what the group was doing in the spring of 1940 as the Nazis marched into Denmark and Norway, the group was cataloging schemes for disarmament throughout history. They went all the way back to the ancient Greeks who had prohibited poisoning wells right up to Winston Churchill's suggestion in 1913 
of a one-year holiday on naval building. They compiled these schemes and they sent them in a memo to the State Department on May 1st of 1940 on the verge of the Nazi invasion of France. This is what they thought was worthwhile doing. Then the Nazi war machine invaded France. And to the surprise of everyone, including some of Hitler's own generals, France fell within just six weeks. Suddenly, Adolf Hitler was master of Europe. And for a while, it seemed quite likely that he would conquer Britain and the British Empire. Now, in the summer of 1940, the American political class perceived a crisis. Congress quickly instituted the first ever draft in peacetime, and it approved a vast military buildup. But what was the crisis all about? It's not obvious, not easy to explain. Few observers believe that North America faced much danger of being successfully invaded from across the Atlantic. And the US economy was so self-contained, especially after the depression, that it didn't need much foreign trade. America, that is, remained safe and prosperous. And that's what the post-war planners in the Council on Foreign Relations concluded. At the very worst part of the crisis in the summer of 1940, they assumed that henceforth, the United States might be confined to its own hemisphere. And in fact, only what they called for a brief period of time, a quarter sphere extending from North America down to the place where Brazil bulges out into the Atlantic. And, and that's it. This quarter sphere would be the area that the United States would trade in and defend militarily for the foreseeable future. And in crude material terms, that wasn't terrible. The economists Hansen and Viner concluded that the US economy could perform adequately within that quarter sphere. For that reason, some Americans believed the United States should build its military strength. So it should guard the hemisphere against any outside invasion, but it should not commit to go further. That would suffice, they argued, to keep the United States safe in any eventuality, because without having a territorial foothold in the Western Hemisphere, it was very hard to see how a foreign power would be able to mount an invasion on the United States and North America. That was the view of a coalition of Americans who gathered under the banner America First. But by the autumn of 1940, as Britain withstood Germany's bombing, FDR and other foreign policymakers began to make a different choice. To them, a hemispheric existence might be adequate, but it was not ideal. As internationalists, American elites expected to be able to trade and move across the globe. And as nationalists or exceptionalists, they expected that the United States would define world history. This was the problem if the Axis powers were to rule Europe and Asia, or if another totalitarian power were ever to do the same sometime in the future. America's territory might be safe, its economy might be sound, but it would be isolated from the world, isolated from history, to use the term of the time, meaning that American intercourse and influence would be circumscribed. FDR himself warned that if Hitler defeated Britain, America would become, to quote Roosevelt, a lone island in a world dominated by the philosophy of force. Americans would experience, and I quote, the nightmare of a people lodged in prison, handcuffed, hungry, and fed through the bars from day to day by the contemptuous, by the contemptuous, unpitying masters of other continents. Now, FDR here was assuming that the United States would still be dominant in the Western Hemisphere and safe in North America. And yet he still said that, the, that America would become a passive sufferer. It would be on the receiving end of world history, not making it. So this idea of isolation switched the goalposts. It said it was bad enough for the United States to be confined to the Western Hemisphere, even if secure and prosperous. Previously, internationalism had hinged on the assumption that interaction could transcend force, but Hitler had seemed to prove the opposite true. Peaceful interaction 
was not exactly peaceful. It depended on force. There could be no trade, no law, no order, except if defended by overwhelming force. So let me take a, a few minutes to describe how the council's planners put this insight into practice. I mentioned the quarter sphere idea that they devised in June and July of 1940, right after France fell. In the three months that followed, the economists took a monumental study at the request of the State Department to ask how much of the world did the United States really want for the future after the war? Now, they assumed at this point that Nazi Germany would control the whole of Europe in league with the Axis powers for the foreseeable future. That wasn't on the table. It didn't seem changeable. So what they sought to find was a post-war area that met several criteria. It would be economically self-sufficient, more self-sufficient than the projected Axis-led Europe. That way, the US-led bloc would have more bargaining power. There would be as little governmental regimentation of trade as possible. So the only way to get rid of imbalances of trade would be to make the area bigger to export surplus goods. And finally, the United States would take the lead in defending the whole area by force. So these are an expansive set of requirements. Uh, they allow no compromise with liberal capitalism. They call for a superior uh, economic and uh, geopolitical position over a, an Axis-led Europe in the future. So the planners started out considering a post-war sphere now consisting of the whole Western Hemisphere, but they found the hemisphere to be insufficient. It left South America with large trade surpluses. So this was in August of 1940. In September, they added a massive Pacific region, including Australia, India, and even Japan. The planners just assumed that Japan could be integrated into the US-led area in the same month that Japan joined the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. But this area too was deemed insufficient. It still left large surpluses of agricultural goods. So in October, the planners added in the rest of the British Empire, including the British Empire, including the British Isles. Thus, they wound up with the whole non-German world except the Soviet Union, which they ignored at this time because it was neutral in the war and didn't have much foreign trade. So the planners concluded that the United States must hold to quote them unquestioned power in the world and use quote its military power to protect the maximum possible area of the non-German world. This plan came to be called the grand area. And if there's a single first blueprint for US military dominance, I think this would be it. I don't wanna overstate the significance of the calculations involved because I think they were simply somewhat more rigorous than the kind of thinking that was happening more broadly in the administration and even in the public sphere. But it shows how rapidly America's imagined place in the post-war world changed in the span of just half a year, leaping from the quarter sphere to the grand area. In the next month, the US Navy developed the first war plan that linked US security to the global balance of power and the survival of the British Empire. By the end of 1940 then, many American foreign policy elites glimpsed a future of US military supremacy precisely because they were losing faith in internationalism as previously understood because peaceful interaction could no longer be trusted to overcome power politics. America had to keep order by force. Now let me turn to some of the events of 1941. Although my book extends to 1945, uh, I'll, I'll mainly stop before Pearl Harbor in order to convey just how much of America's place in the world had been conceived even before the United States officially entered the war. Uh, at the time, in fact, uh, some who advocated intervention like the columnist Walter Lippmann repeated that the United States was in the war in all but name. Uh, the United States Congress passed a Lend-Lease uh, bill to uh, open the spigot of aid to Great Britain and any other ally uh, that needed it in their fight against the Axis. After that, it was undeniable that although few Americans wanted to enter the war, the vast majority would sooner stop the Axis than keep out of the war. 
Suddenly, a new world order became a matter of wide discussion. The publishing mogul Henry Luce proclaimed a start to the American century in a famous essay already in February of 1941. In 1941, it seemed urgent to articulate an alternative future to the Axis new order in Europe and Asia. And in private, post-war planners considered how to implement the American century. Should the United States form an alliance with Great Britain, or should it revive a universal world organization on the model of the League of Nations? And at this point, they gave a clear answer they envisioned an exclusive American-British alliance to police the post-war world, which they defined against a general world organization. As one of the planners ex explained early in 1941, peace cannot be assured without force, force that is overwhelming and controlled by those whose self-interest will ensure its utilization. Hanson Baldwin, a New York Times military analyst, led a group that sketched out bases around the globe from which an American-British post-war police force would operate. World order, he said, now required to quote him, world domination by the United States and the British Empire. The planners worked to design, again to quote their words, a policy essentially offensive in character. This was the same military group that was cataloging disarmament proposals before the fall of France. Now they were proposing a joint American-British post-war police force modeled in part on British imperial policing in the greater Middle East. At the peak of Anglophone feeling in early June of 1941, the planners in the Council on Foreign Relations went so far as to draft an act of Congress that would grant US citizenship to citizens of the British Commonwealth, that is the white settler dominions. That idea didn't get very far in actual politics, but it does reveal how the planners were drawing inspiration, not from the League of Nations or universalist schemes, but rather from the model of the British Empire. And President Roosevelt felt rather similarly. In August of 1941, he and Winston Churchill went uh, to Newfoundland and released the Atlantic Charter, the first official statement of post-war aims. Sometimes the charter appears in narratives as a step in a linear progression toward the, eventual, toward the eventual United Nations. But at the time, FDR refused to endorse any post-war organization, actually over the objections of Churchill. He explained that only America and Britain could keep peace in the post-war world. But the Atlantic Charter fell like a dead duck in the words of the council planners, as they observed the reaction in Congress and the public, they quickly perceived that their biggest obstacle lay at home. US global supremacy sounded, well, un-American. It sounded contrary to traditional ideals of American nationalism and internationalism. As the planners commented, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points from the last war had promised universal disarmament, at least eventually, but FDR promised indefinite domination by America and Britain. Even John Foster Dulles, the future Cold Warrior Secretary of State, objected to the Atlantic Charter uh, for offering a vision, to quote him, of Anglo-Saxon military and economic hegemony. So the planners worried with some justification. Would the public refuse to shoulder the burdens of post-war leadership. And now they worried that the Atlantic Charter wasn't the right model. A week before Pearl Harbor, they warned the State Department. To quote them, an imperialistic connotation may all too easily been, be given to the projected American-British policing of the seas, not only by Axis propaganda mongers, but by perfectly sincere people as well. In short, US supremacy needed to be legitimated. It was something quite different from what America had done and told itself it had done before. And beginning at the end of 1941 and continuing throughout the war, they hit upon a solution. Reclaim the mantle of internationalism and international organization. Now they positioned US military dominance as the essence, the epitome of internationalism as opposed to 
this recent coinage isolationism. Armed dominance now became the culmination of an American tradition, not a departure. And as the war went on, that they attacked isolationism, if anything, more and more, even as opposition to US involvement in the war evaporated. Historians wrote new narratives that projected back this internationalism, isolationism struggle back to the very founding of the country and back to the, the fight over the League of Nations in 1919. It was as though advocates of internationalism meaning armed dominance had been there from the beginning. And having heaped scorn on an international organization for the past several years, now post-war planners embraced it. Some kind of world organization they figured seemed essential for convincing the American public to accept world leadership because international organizations symbolize the old aspiration to end power politics, to overcome war and conflict. It could become a useful vehicle to implement the dominance of power politics by the United States. And this was the argument that convinced an initially quite skeptical President Roosevelt in 1943. President Roosevelt had been thinking first along American British lines, then he was thinking about adding a few more great powers, but he was very skeptical that a universal organization would be useful until he learned that really there didn't have to be a choice between projecting American power and being part of a world organization. In fact, the two, if properly designed, went hand in hand. And so just after achieving victory over Japan in October of 1945, a new president, Harry Truman, could stand before the Congress and proclaim, as a matter of course, we must relentlessly preserve our superiority on land and sea and in the air. Now, let me conclude with a few uh, provocations and implications for the present. I think that the wartime origins of America's commitment to armed primacy tell us something fundamental but paradoxical about US foreign policy in our own era. On the one hand, America's commitment to global dominance easily outlasted the Cold War competition with Soviet communism. Because the United States embraced primacy earlier, it makes sense that it continued to do so after the Cold War. Primacy was never about the Soviet Union. It never even hinged on a specific enemy. It was conceived as a long-term project, grounded in the argument that a decent liberal world order required armed enforcement by a superior United States. The Axis conquests of 1940 and 41 caused Americans to draw a general conclusion about the nature of international society in a world where the Nazis could even come close to superiority. Some other power sometime in the future could do likewise. So from the middle of 1941 onward, as American observers became increasingly confident that Nazi Germany might be able to be defeated within Europe. They didn't say, well, that's great. America can then do that job and then go back to its former role in the world once the war ends. Instead, they expanded the grand area to include Europe and thus embrace the entire world. And much the same happened in the 1990s. Soviet communism collapsed and American leaders responded by fulfilling their aspiration for one world united under American leadership. It also helped that initially in the 1990s, the costs of pursuing armed dominance seemed low given that potential competitors were so weak. But here's the paradoxical part. Something crucial has changed in the world since the middle of the, night of the 20, 20th century. It isn't the lack of a great power rival per se, but rather the disappearance of totalitarianism as an alternative way to organize international society and exchanges across borders. The original reason why US policymakers conceived that of military dominance 
was that they feared the specter of a totalitarian alternative that could corrupt liberal American style interaction. Once the fascists were defeated, once the communists collapsed, who was to say some other obstructions to liberal order wouldn't present themselves? So it could look better at the time to nip them in the bud. But today, does that specter exist? Communism died and stayed dead, or as in China, it rose again, but only by mutating into one party state capitalism, which is open for business with the rest of the world, whether on fair terms or not. And in fact, China is the world's largest trading nation. In this kind of a world, exactly why does the United States need to maintain military preeminence? Might the pursuit of primacy be more likely to create antagonisms, to disrupt exchange and interaction, the very uh, antithesis of what it was instituted to do, which was to enable exchange and interaction. These questions now seem out in the open today. And that's partly, I think, because uh, Donald Trump ran for president and won, promising a different foreign policy. It was misunderstood widely initially as isolationist. But nevertheless, it passed muster with enough voters in enough states. Uh, now, President Trump never opposed US military dominance. To the contrary, he promised from the beginning to build up the US military. He uh, said that he pursued peace through strength, this, much the same words as several of his predecessors. But I think the fact that he was elected and the nature uh, of his conduct makes clear that US world leadership faces a crisis of legitimacy today at home. Very few people, I think, believed that President Trump had a strategy to use America's enormous coercive power or a theory to bring peace. Armed dominance has become something like an end unto itself. And that, I think, means that Americans face a choice. Either they should openly espouse endless war, which the planners of military dominance understood would be basically inevitably entailed by playing such a large military role in the world, or they should chart a different course for the rest of the 21st century. Now, I have my own views about that, and I'm happy to discuss them in reference to our, our current challenges. But however one thinks about how the United States should change its approach going forward, I do think that the first step as a historian uh, should be to think outside the boundaries established in World War II. That requires us to reject the advice of Henry Luce, who wrote in his American Century essay in 1941 that Americans had to decide between, quote, those old, old labels, internationalism and isolationism. He wrote, we can make a truly American internationalism something as natural to us in our own time as the airplane or the radio. And I think that's exactly what happened. Americans ever since came to find their supremacy to be natural. They accepted that internationalism and isolationism were the horizons of possibility in their foreign policy. And my hope is that uh, new generations will free themselves up to be more creative about the challenges we face now. So I will just leave it there and very much look forward uh, to any of your comments and questions. Thank you, Stephen, very much. This has been really interesting. And um, I, we have one question here. I think uh, other people, please put your questions in. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, one thing that really struck me. Um, I, I think we often think of US policy happening behind closed doors. You know, the State Department, the Pentagon, the, the White House, it's all happening over there. And what you kept talking again and again is what the American public would accept, um, that, that the decisions that are being made are not being made just wanted. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that trend in our. Thanks. I, um... I use an unusual set of actors, I think it's fair to say, for um, a book of this nature. 
a lot of books will focus on the very highest decision makers, in this case, FDR and his top advisors. And the focus will be very narrow. And it's very appealing because these particular people, men at that time, have a lot of power. Um, but I wanted to look at a kind of class of people just below the surface who did influence those at the top, but who would go on to implement American foreign policy for decades to come, and who had the time and space to think seriously and record their thoughts, helpful for a historian, uh, about America's post-war role even in the early stages of World War II. And what I found was a sort of different, maybe a different kind of elite uh, than we see today. Um, they were very sensitive to the demands of the public, to what the public would accept. They just uh, gained the new tool at that time of uh, public opinion surveys conducted by Gallup and, and others. And they, were, they would constantly look at those surveys. They were interested in that, but they also spoke about public opinion in a somewhat different and more intangible way. Uh, they often used that language as a kind of stand-in for um, what, what seemed legitimate based on their knowledge of the American public. They had just gone through the 1930s in which uh, in a perhaps unprecedented peace movement had emerged to try to keep the United States out of the looming war in Europe and out of the ongoing conflict in East Asia. So they knew, and that was very influential in Congress and shaped the US reaction to the looming war in Europe, uh, most of all by uh, passing uh, neutrality acts on the part of Congress uh, that imposed restrictions on what the Roosevelt administration could do. So they were aware that the public uh, mattered in the making of foreign policy and sensitive to how the public might uh, perceive things even long into the future, even though actually, if you looked at a lot of the uh, opinion surveys at the time, the public was often, as far as one could tell, basically where the, the elites were where the people were planning the future or trying to plan the future behind closed doors. Uh, so you might say, what do they have to worry about? But I think they acutely understood uh, that the country had certain, a certain sense of itself uh, rooted in a tradition uh, and rooted in ideas of internationalism that would have to be overcome or co-opted or molded in some way uh, in order to create uh, the bulwark of legitimacy that would be needed to sustain such a costly um, and potentially risky and dangerous um, US role far into the future, which is what they were, these particular actors were interested in. Um, what I don't do in the book is attempt to make a study of what Americans at the grassroots level actually thought that is a serious, a serious enterprise. And I think some historians are, are doing more work on that, which I think is very valuable. Um, but uh, what I'm most interested in is understanding what the public meant to, to the mm -hmm. group of post-war planners and intellectuals who were thinking about these matters, because it didn't necessarily need to be a correspondence between what ordinary Americans were thinking and what they were trying to account for as they took the public uh, seriously. And they did take the public seriously. Uh, you know, they would put forward proposals sometimes in the spirit of here are multiple ideas. Uh, even as they were trying to, you know, rally the country around one particular vision by the end of, by the, end of the war. Uh, and so I think our current uh, crop of experts in Washington are often less attentive to just the potential role that the American public could play uh, in uh, steering foreign policy, uh, and they tend to put out, you know, single-minded, uh, consensus-driven reports uh, rather than presenting certain certain ones in the spirit of having a debate. And I think it'd be useful uh, to to hmm. learn a little bit from that earlier model. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so I think here we have 
Paul, who uh, he came here from Ireland 32 years ago, is now in, in Connecticut. So welcome from Connecticut, Paul. Um, curious about the uh, American obsession with the British Empire and um, wondering what you could say about, about, about that and what it says about U.S.'s own sense of, of self. I see he's from Old Saybrook, Connecticut, where I happen to spend a lot of time with my in-laws, um, which is a wonderful place. Um, this was a striking part of my research. Um, I did not expect, you know, I sensed American foreign policy changed very much over the course of World War II. Uh, what I didn't e even intuit going in was how popular and specific ideas were in 1941 for the United States to form an intimate partnership with what had been its um, longtime rival, the, the British Empire. Uh, that was quite a revelation. And I think the, the questioner is asking in part about sympathy about this identification some Americans have with Great Britain. Some of that had been built up uh, quite consciously by British elites uh, over a number of decades uh, by instruments like the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, a lot of the post-war planners had spent time in the UK and really identified um, with the UK in that way. But in 1941, there were even some relative Anglophobes who still thought that the American-British partnership uh, was a sound idea. Uh, and they thought that in part because really for the first time, it was evident that the United States would be the senior partner in the relationship going forward. That was not evident earlier. You, you could criticize, and many did at the time, the League of Nations for being behind the shroud of universalism, a de facto American-British alliance. But uh, it was that was actually a very effective criticism because it was indeed hard in 1919 and 1920 to see how the United States would actually be the dominant power uh, and Americanize Europe, as Woodrow Wilson promised, rather than see America Europeanized. But uh, once the uh, British uh, power was uh, threatened in Europe and Asia simultaneously, it was abundantly clear on both sides of the Atlantic that that was uh, the end for the British empire or the British world leadership project sustaining itself in anything like the same way. And so the economist at the time calls for uh, the United States to enter uh, as the senior partner in the relationship. And even the post-war planners that I've discussed shifted from talking about uh, Anglo-American partnership to American-British partnership in 1941, revealing how clearly they understood that the United States would be a superior power. So although there was a lot of um, pro-British uh, sentiment um, there was also a more hard-headed appreciation that the United States would be dominant, that that's what made this scheme for American-British partnership more appealing than previous, previous schemes. I think it's a slightly different question of how we get to the present, to this nostalgia for, uh, over the special relationship and, um, and the British royalty, and I, I can't even pretend to understand what's going on there. That's interesting. As Steve Feisman just noted, they're just looking around Philadelphia and at suburbs, he says, you know, our architecture, institutions of all sorts are deeply rooted in England and English culture. And this was true going into the early 1940s to that point. Um, so Jeffrey from New York City was wonders if you can comment on the wisdom of America, quote, taking on both Russia and China as stated as current goals by the as goals by the current administration. Thanks. I think that's a, a concern um, that I share. Um, I think that uh, to the extent the administration seems to want to emphasize China as a significant challenger, um, 
then it would be wise uh, to not try to take on two significant powers at once, especially two powers that um, have a lot to um, have a lot to argue over. They have they share a, a large land border. Uh, they have not been so um, close in the past for in fact for for many decades. But it is worrying that the United States might by painting the two with the same brush, uh, whether as rival great powers or authoritarians, might drive the two together where they uh, might otherwise uh, be apart. And I think this is actually quite relevant to, um, to, the, to the history that uh, we've been discussing. Um, the commitment to universal military dominance uh, is, I think, um, kind of at the root of why this administration, but not this administration in particular, why uh, so many American administrations since the end of the Cold War um, have um, found a whole world of adversaries uh, where there didn't necessarily need to be so many. Um, it's because the United States uh, wants to be dominant in each region, Europe, the greater Middle East, East Asia, or what's now called the Indo-Pacific, rather than starting from the premise of what uh, do American interests require in this changed international environment, the policymaking seems to often start from the question of how can the United States maintain its position of dominance both globally and in each particular domain. And so I think that uh, that logic seriously inhibits um, the administration from um, doing what Obama the Obama administration promised it would do uh, a decade ago, which is pivot to Asia. If you pivot to something, you have to pivot away from something. And so right now that hasn't happened. It may happen uh, in the future, but I'm not sure I would bet on it uh, precisely because this logic of global dominance is so firmly ingrained. Uh, that's, yeah, so, so I think this ties into a couple of the other questions that are in the queue uh, from, from Brendan. Uh, he's wondering um, if, you, if you think that even today the American public has a schizophrenic view of American power, a preferring to view the country as number one, uh, the number one superpower while also growing quickly weary of foreign entanglements such as Iraq or Afghanistan, or you know, think of 101 that we have engaged in the last 50 years. Yeah, there might be some schizophrenia or um, incoherence there, but I'm not sure it's um, on the part of the public as opposed to foreign policy experts. I think experts and leaders display the exact same tendency. And it's summed up in the phrase, peace through strength, which uh, Ronald Reagan prominently used, Donald Trump most recently has used it. And some progressives and Democrats used it too. And the theory is that the United States will uh, have uh, such an overwhelming dominance that no rival will possibly challenge America. And so there will be deterrence everywhere and forever. And you know, if that were true, then that would be fine. Uh, it's just not so. Um, and this was, uh, by the way, the logic that was quite explicitly laid out in 1992 in the Pentagon's uh, defense planning guidance uh, toward the end of the, the first Bush administration. Um, so there's a kind of conscious theory put forward. And what we've seen is that the rest of the world is not, in fact, um, incapable of resisting what the United States wants to do at a certain moment in time. And although American power might be greater uh, than any other, the United States uh, spends more on its military than the next 11 countries spend combined on their militaries. Uh, when you get to the specifics, it is not the case that the United States is uh, overwhelming in power in Afghanistan uh, because there is uh, a limit to what the United States uh, will be able to do there. Uh, whereas the people who live in Afghanistan 
uh, have stronger interests in what they want there than the distant United States does. Uh, so I think we have a broader grand strategic um, incoherence or schizophrenia. Uh, I think as long as the United States commits to um, peace through strength, meaning globe spanning military dominance with our forces scattered around the world, um, that will not bring peace, but rather endless war. Um, and, and so, so Lynn also on that point, last question too, and he's, you know, he appreciates your, your reminder that Trump's foreign policy constituted a reaction to the fact that the U.S. no longer had a totalitarian enemy, um, you know, one that required some idealism in response and wonders if the U.S. post-Trump can maintain support for NATO and these other international alliances without insisting upon the crucial necessity of an alliance of democratic states against an implacable foe. Well, such an insightful question. Um, I can only restate it um, with a question mark at the end. I think it's really um, trenchant to suggest that Donald Trump figured out a different language to think about America's place in the world in a post-totalitarian environment. I think he's the first president to really do that. Um, he wasn't interested in what kind of regime uh, another country was. Um, he was his, the specter that he put forward was the specter of globalism, of various flows, inclu including immigrants, uh, that to hear him talk about it could corrupt the United States and that traversed um, the foreign and the domestic divide. Whatever you might say about that conceptualization of America's place in the world, it was very different uh, from those of his predecessors. What he didn't do was make significant changes to American alliances, which actually increased, not decreased under his watch. Uh, and he continued to boost the US military in an attempt to deter all others. There was no real guiding theory of what America's core interests were uh, that should underpin uh, a different strategy. Um, but he did put forward some very um, interesting um, uh, framings of the United States place in a post-totalitarian world. And I think the Biden administration is, as, the, as, 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 as Lynn suggests, trying to bring back this kind of Cold War-esque um, mentality in which democracies and authoritarians square off um, and whether that is truly sustainable for the kind of world we're in uh, remains to be seen, but I think there are reasons to have doubts. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. I think here's a, a nice fun one from Eileen wondering um, if you have a next book in that you're beginning to work on and if you can tell a little bit about that. Oh my, um, well, I do, you, you can see how I got here. I, I have become increasingly interested about the 1990s uh, up to the present. And I think in some fashion, I'm still thinking it through very early days. In some fashion, I want to um, use my historical training uh, to go back uh, just to the 1990s and trace up to the present how it is that the United States um, made a decision not to pull back its power after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but actually to expand uh, its military commitments. Uh, the United States has actually used armed force more frequently after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, than it did during the Cold War itself. And it's not even close in terms of the numbers. Uh, so I want to understand that better and also understand how the domestic politics of foreign policy has changed. I was uh, surprised to find the other day that the New York Times editorial board opposed the first round of uh, the expansion of the NATO alliance in 1998, when the Senate approved uh, that first and fateful round, adding the first three countries. Um, so in some ways, uh, there were live possibilities in the 1990s uh, that didn't necessarily win out at the time, uh, but were quite 
acute. Uh, the criticisms that the Times made about uh, how uh, dividing Europe in this way might antagonize Russia seem to be quite, uh, quite prescient given what's happened uh, several decades since. So in some fashion, I want to look into this. So please stay tuned, but give me some time. <laughs> Wonderful, Eileen, I'm sure you will. And uh, Paul Nugent note there, he's uh, issuing you uh, an invitation to, to speak sometime to the Southeast Connecticut mm -hmm. World Affairs Council. Perfect. And uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more, you can uh, buy this book uh, many places. We encourage you to buy it at bookshop.org. It is a, an online uh, bookstore that supports independent uh, bookshops. A uh, portion of their proceeds goes to support uh, independent bookstores. A portion also comes to support the Athenaeum. So I hope you'll find it there. If you're an Athenaeum member, you can uh, find it in our library, or you may have to wait and decide to buy it because it may be out um, being read by somebody else. If you're a shareholder, you can have the book mailed to you anywhere you are in the United States um, if you're not currently in Philadelphia. Bonus of being a shareholder. We're so glad that you all came tonight, and this is the end of our, our summer speaker series. We'll, we'll be doing some small things in the summer, uh, some, some movies on site and so forth. Um, our book clubs continue virtually. Uh, our mystery book club meeting next on July 1st, and books with me, books that I am currently reading and thinking about. Um, June, July 20th, we will talk about the first half of 400 Souls. In August, we'll talk about the second half. Um, so glad that you all attended. If you are not on our weekly newsletter list, please go to philaathenaeum.org slash contact us. Uh, if you want to learn more about membership, go to our website and find out more. Follow us on social media. Um, we'd love to have you part of our community if you are not already. Stephen, we are so grateful that you came and I'll give you the last word as we close out the evening. Well, I am just very grateful uh, to you for proposing this and to everybody for attending and asking some really stimulating questions that I'm going to continue to think about, especially that question about my next book. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Everybody have a wonderful evening and thank you to Stephen Wertheim for your time and your uh, a gracious, gracious, gracious time to us in your talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>